Welcome to another episode of Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. I'm your host, Brother Gustavo. For those who are not familiar with the Heralds, the Heralds of the Gospel are a community active in the Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto, as well as several other cities across Canada. Founded by Monsignor Jean Cladias, the Heralds comprise priests, religious, brothers and sisters, and lay people since their pontifical recognition in 2001 by Pope John Paul II. And for those who are familiar with the Heralds, this podcast features the talks following the Heralds weekly rosary at St. Patrick's Parish in Schomburg, Ontario, where the brothers share some consoling and encouraging thoughts precisely geared to those dreaded beginnings of a probably hard week called Mondays. If you want to know more about the origin of the podcast, please stop right here. Go back and listen to episode number one. So even if today it's not Monday, but you're still commuting or doing chores, take heart brighten your perspectives and enjoy today's talk recorded at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg. The topic? Get to know more about the Blessed Trinity by Brother Justin Bonian. Welcome then to Talks for a Magical Monday, the weekly podcast of the Heralds of the Gospel. Salve Maria, and welcome to one more of these magical Mondays in quarantine. This is Brother Justin Bonian. And we are here in the Herald's House in Schaumburg on this glorious, sunny uh, June day. And today I'm going to talk about what was celebrated liturgically yesterday, which is White Sunday. White Sunday. I want to just give you uh, two sides to it, which is... That um, White Sunday is an incredibly ancient feast day. I'm gonna before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's talk, I'm going to look at the element of the traditions that um, are tied in to White Sunday. Um, most of these, it's interesting. Many times people think that when we when we summarize names or so, it's a modern phenomenon. And the reality is that it's anything but uh, many of the short forms of names that we use today, such as Harry or uh, Robert or Robbie or uh, Rob or uh, uh, Rick, are actually medieval and they were used much more often in the medieval times than they are presently. So, um, firstly, White Sunday in the, in the medieval era was uh, a day that many children who were born during the, the, the festivals of Easter and of Lent would have their children baptized. It was usually an occasion of much festivity in their communities, particularly in the northern part of England. And they would, of course, be dressed in white. That was the normal gown that you would have for the child um, for, their, for their baptism. That would correspond also to the liturgical color of white being used for the Sunday of the Holy Trinity. The other element of it, and this it, it, it actually it lines up. It was the beginning of some of the food festivals and the patron saints, uh, particularly in the more pastoral areas. Um, so the big thing was in the north north northwest was the cheese festivals. These would be um, Stiltons and various cheeses, Gloucestershire. The various areas which have uh, large cheese cultures. Um, and of course, once there is um, cheese, there needs to be bread, and the bread and cheese festivals were very large in, in those areas. 
And I guess with that, of course, being in these Nordic uh, traditions, um, it was accompanied by copious amounts of a special brew called Wit Sun Ale. And that was the... Uh, was one that was brewed particularly for this festival of this Sunday. So it's something which is very true. And these festivals existed in the Middle Ages. And they would be slowly stomped out by the Protestant in, uh, reformers um, and crushed totally with um, the reforms of the Puritan Commonwealth. Um, so when they came back, they came back in a more uh, form of um, a form which was not as traditional, but um, probably more uh, formal as such. And unfortunately, in those regions of England, um, although they always remained much more Catholic than other areas of England, uh, they were detached from their Catholic roots, so they're more or less like um, cut flowers, which are beautiful to behold, but knowing that they are now dead. So Whitsun Sunday was kind of, if you want to put it this way, in England was the beginning of summer. It was when all the festivals would start kicking off all of the uh, the beauties uh, that you've 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 confined yourselves to your homes during the months of winter and of uh, of the icky sp spring now it's glorious summer so that's kind of where you might see whitson if you read medieval uh, sources this would be where they would bring in um designations of ends of wars they would uh, have breaks at this period so allowing the farmers to farm so that's kind of the cultural background to the white sunday or whitsun but today i'm going to go into something far more um, interesting than talk about cheese and bread even though those are very good in themselves we're going to look at the theology of this sunday and why this sunday is so very and very important Okay, so firstly, um, this festival in the liturgical calendar is old, um, and the 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 reason for it is incredibly important because um, think of it: without the Holy Trinity, as Christians, what are we, right? Very much um, dwelt the Holy Trinity, we end up in a very strange place. We end up in a very um, odd place. We end up in a place uh, which is, you might say, is totally non-Christian. Um, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is very, very necessary for us. But what's interesting about it is that it's a festival which is it crosses both lungs of the church, the east and west. Um, the solemnity of the most holy trinity, that's the formal term for it. And it marked, prior to the Vatican Council, it marked a three-week, an end of a three-week period where churches, weddings were forbidden. So this would have been the official beginning of... The wedding season also. The period began uh, on Rogation Sunday, the fifth Sunday after Easter. Trinity Sunday was established as a double or a second, cl uh, or a second class festival to, to celebrate the Trinity. And during the Middle Ages, especially during the Carolingian period, devotion to the Most Holy Trinity was the most highly important feature of private devotion and inspired many of the liturgical expressions that will come out during the Middle Ages. Okay. The Athanasian Creed. Now that is one creed that you almost never hear about. And the Athanasian Creed is fascinating because it's basically his line in the sand against the Arians. Um, it defines the position of the church in front of the Arian heresy about the full godship of the Trinity. 
So um, that's kind of your, your beginning of it. But today we're going to look at some of the more fascinating elements. I'm going to start with a little story. And the little story is is taken from um, the life of Saint Augustine, Saint Augustine of Hippo, the great saint of the of the fifth century. He is um, wandering on the beach of the Mediterranean, as any good man would do, is walk along and think. And he's thinking not necessarily about his lunch or dinner or or what are his business endeavors. He's trying to understand. And the best way of packaging, in a certain sense, the Holy Trinity. To understand the Holy Trinity. Now, some have us, in this story, have St. Augustine walking on the beach. Some have him dreaming it. One way or the other doesn't change the value of the story. So, he sees a young boy on the beach... And this boy is is emptying pail after pail of water into a hole which he has dug with much effort. This this hole in the sand. Just make sure our pictures are right. So intrigued, he approaches the boy and asks him, What are you doing, little boy? I'm trying to put all the water of the sea into the hole in the sand. Sounds like a little boy. Sounds like a project here. But don't you see that that's impossible? There's the philosopher. There's the latrician. You may say there's the man. Unable to see the poetic side of it all. He's looking at it pure and simple. Now the boy turns on him and says, But yet Augustine is easier to empty the entire sea into this hole than for you to understand the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. With this wise response, the doctor of grace, and I would say the Trinity, because his De Trinitatis work is paramount in understanding the church's view of the Trinity, Realize his insufficiency of his human intelligence, as brilliant as it was, and moved on. Now, the first point is is that we have to understand, and we learned this in catechism class, God is one, but God has three persons. And each person is co-equal, is co-eternal. And in that co-eternalness, the Father... Begets the Son. And the love of the Father and Son beget the Holy Spirit. But this divine begettenness is outside of the realm of time. And being that it's outside the realm of time, it's outside of our minds, really. Without the gift of grace, we'll never get to where we are. And we can see that very much in the writings of St. Justin of the Martyr, uh, who's Feast, unfortunately, was uh, not celebrated this liturgical year as the Feast of Mary as Mother of the Church took its place. And and Augustine is arguing with um, his foe. We're not sure if it's real or imaginary, but Typhus the Jew. And this is where the problem is, that logically they're talking the same language. But when he gets to the Trinity... Typhus' mind is blown. He just can't can't follow him, can't go with him on that. It's too far. It's the bridge too far. And through logic, that is true. Logic, I can prove God exists. But when it comes to the point of proving a trinity, ah, that's that, that's very that, that's where God really needs to supplant. So let's go to the biblical phrase, which is uttered by the Lord. And this will help us with our quick overview of the Trinity. I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not seek and speak on his own authority 
But whatever he hears, he will speak, and what he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take this, what is mine, and declare it to you. And find that in John 16. This next couple of Sundays are really important because we have White Sunday, Serenity Sunday, but next week we have we have Corpus Christi. And to understand the love that God has for us, we have to understand that love is the essence of God and that the love this who is from the be, from from the Father and the Son who would beget the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, the spirit of prophecy, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of love. If we understand those elements, then we can place ourselves and understand why we can't understand it. That sounds stupid. That sounds like an oxymoronic statement. But imagine if you were to get your little pet dog and try to explain all that you do. Why do you do what you do for your animals? Why do you do what you do to your to those possessions you have? But this is not even a good comparison because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is a whole different level, but this has a poor and pale comparison. We look at it and we see that God's love, which is creative, which which is which is something which creates the action of virtue within our own hearts. God's love creates good within us. But your dog will never understand, even if you're able to speak the same language. Imagine if you loved ants for some reason, and you begot yourself into an ant, made yourself an ant, had the ants beat you up, Try to kill you. Sacrifice yourself for the ant's good. Would the ants ever understand that love? And the answer is no. So by pure reason, we'll never get there. Now, Augustine will write and tell us something to help us understand why we're so inadequate. Wherefore, if we desire to understand the eternity and the equity and the unity of the Trinity, as much as it is permitted to us, we ought first to believe before we understand. So faith is necessary to understand. And what's fascinating with this is that this will be one of the points of Anselm's faith-seeking understanding. Because it's, if we seek in an atheistic model in truth, we're, we're never going to get anywhere. What's very sad is when you meet or you hear biblical scholars who are avowed atheists or avowed agnostics, and you wonder how they got there. Well, because they didn't have faith to start off with. They had faith in themselves. So when they arrived at points that were above their pay grade, instead of having the humility to kind of accept it, no, they denied it. So they end up in a very strange place. Some people would wonder, why don't they just let it all go? And the reason is, is that they, as the phrase goes, they have too much invested. You've studied for 20 years of your life, and you don't, you don't believe anymore. Well, you might as well become a bartender or something. Become a professor of biblical texts who has no faith, and even more, he's skeptical of anything. A very famous... Um, Dominican of this uh, a Spaniard, his name is Father Royal Marine, he said something interesting, repays his father with a similar love, equally eternal and infinite, when the impetuous current of love that springs forth from the father meets with what springs from the son, a torrent of flame, which is the Holy Spirit, leaps forth, so to speak. This the mystery 
of the Trinity is such that many, many, many people can come up with different concepts. But it's one of those things that when we die and go to heaven, we will be able to repeat that line of St. Paul, no eye has seen, no ear has heard. And then we'll, ah, if I only knew. Now, children might not get this point, but many an adult has already uttered those infamous lines. It is impossible to attain to the knowledge of the Trinity by natural reason. That's Aquinas. And he again says, What belongs to the unity of essence, but not what belongs to the distinction of persons. This is classic Aquinas. Aquinas is Aristilian to his foundational points. But without knowing it, he had been taught a lot of Plato in his formation. But he's making categories, he's making distinctions, and that is incredibly towards the Aristilian presentation. The Trinity is something which is baffling to the pagan, to the unbeliever. But the believer, once you accept that God can make something so great that's above us, the fact that he is three persons, one God, and that each person is not the other. We're not talking here about what was known as a modulistic approach in which, um, which unfortunately many of the Protestant groups um, attain to and hold to, which is very uh, sad because this was uh, condemned by early church councils back in the four, three and four hundreds. But that, the modulism would be like you have a person and they could say, well, this person is um, a son to a mother, is a brother to a sibling, and is a husband to a wife. Therefore, three different functions, three different realities, but only one person. And you're like, well, you no, know, we're talking with three distinct persons. So we're three different persons which make one Godhead. St. Anthony Mary, Mary Claret, the Archbishop of Cuba in the 1800s, said the following, Undoubtedly, this appears incomprehensible to you, and if you could understand it perfectly, either we would be this God, or he whose nature we are describing as it is in itself would not be so. What would the incomprehensible divinity have that is precious. If human wisdom could understand that the Lord who lives on high, whom the clouds serve as a lampshade, and who is infinitely superior to all human understanding. Now the second one is, is that once we establish the point that our intellect is unable to comprehend this. We have to understand that this is one of many mysteries. Now, let's, let's look at the word mystery. Mystery is a Greek word, mysteron. And in the East, the term for the sacraments is the same. It's mystron. So divine mysteries in the East relate to A, the truths of the faith, which we cannot fully comprehend, and B, the very actions of grace which transform a, a creature of God into a child of God, and that allow that same child of God to enter into communion with God, that allows that same child of God to be forgiven of their sins, um, making that same child of God a mis minister of his sacraments, um, same one to enter into uh, a covenant of love through marriage and to be blessed and sent on their way to their final end at judgment and to hopefully to heaven. 
So the term mystery or mistron is very essential. So when we talk about mysteries, it isn't in theology as something that, oh, it's not for you to know. It's that it is for you to know. It's for you to delve into. It's for you to open yourself up to something far greater than yourself, to allow yourself to understand, to enter into this internal convivium, this divine convivium, or sacred convivium with the divine, with God himself. Some of the ways of looking at it could be looked in the 11th chapter of Matthew by the actions of the Holy Spirit, the one who searches everything, even the depths of God. Now that's found in Corinthians. Or we can see again in Romans, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Or we can look at the saints. So we look at a saint, St. Saint Mary, Mary Magdalene de Piazzi, who said in a private revelation, I saw a divine guest seated upon a throne. And then another, another holy person once put, This guest, the most noble and worthy of all, is the Holy Spirit who, with the agility of his goodness and love for us, quickly instills himself in every soul ready to receive him, who could declare the marvelous effects that he produces in every place where he is received. He speaks without articulating words, and all can hear his divine silence. He is ever motionless, ever in motion. His mobility is a mobile immobility to convey to all. He always reposes, yet he always acts. And in this, his rest, he carries out the most worthy and admirable works. Always in movement, without ever changing places. He confirms, and at the same time destroys everything he pervades. His immersed and probing wisdom knows, hears, and discovers everything. Without the need of the attentive, he hears the least word spoken by the inmost heart. And as Father Faber tells us, the famous one, part of the Oxford movement. The Holy Spirit speaks more than Jesus, takes a greater initiative, seems to say more. It seems as though the passion of concern that he has for sinners is even greater towards the just. So the Holy Spirit makes us understand and at times tangibly, as we can see in Acts chapter 17, leading us through the darkness, teaching the revealed and the revealed truth in a way which is the word of truth. It is the gift of the consoler of the paraclete that we will be able to gradually understand and form a more precise notion of the Holy Trinity. And the scripture tells us this, but the very liturgy that we pray tells us this, and I quote, God our Father, who by sending into the world the word of truth, the spirit of sanctification, made known to the human race your wondrous mystery, grant us, we pray, that in professing true faith, that we may acknowledge the Trinity of eternal glory and adore your unity, powerful in majesty. The, pro the thing is this, is that it's part of our lives, the Trinity. We are meant to live in Trinity. We are meant to be in this reality at all times. Our Lord announces the paraclete. He announces all of these things. And our Lord knew we were not able to to hear all the things that our Lord needed to speak. So he needed a greater, pen, more penetrating teacher. 
which is the Holy Spirit. And now for that reason, our Lord said he had to leave. So, this marvelous action of grace in our soul, we see naturally that we ourselves believe and we manifest this through something which the faithful, hopefully you and I and everyone does, multiple times a day through the sign of the cross, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Most of our prayers end by edifying the blessed Trinity. In liturgical or pious acts, the Trinity is always reverenced. But we never reflect or take a moment to receive the grandeur of this ministry. We need to understand the the mystery of the Trinity so that we can take better advantage of our own faith. And in taking advantage of our own faith, we can activate it. We can pray to the Holy Trinity. We can pray in a way that is more special, that is more effective, that is more heartfelt. And lastly, before we end, the Holy Spirit will guide us in all the truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. I mean, this is the most fascinating, the complete entire Christian truth in all of its fullness without the danger of erring, at least in what they would require in their future ministry. That was what our Lord said to the apostles. But we receive the same graces in a lesser extent through our confirmations. So let's pray in a special way on this white Saturday, white Sunday, sorry, this Sunday in which we're progressing out of the Easter season that we may put ourselves in the right place, that place of which we need to understand the role of the Holy Spirit, the role of the Father, and of course, the role of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's say a quick glory be, asking for a fullness of these graces, that we can put it all into action. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Most Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. And this is all for today's episode recorded live at the Heralds of the Gospel House in Schomburg, Ontario. You can reach us anytime at one of the Heralds' websites, such as heralds.ca forward slash podcast, new insights multimedia forward slash podcast, or you can also subscribe on iTunes or anywhere you normally listen to your favorite podcast. And as per now, pray hard, work hard, keep growing in devotion to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother, evangelize by word and example, and be every day more and more a real herald of the gospel. Oh